Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Harsab, can you hear me loud and clear? Yeah, of course, we can hear you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, so I can see that Dr. Coffey is with us. Uh, welcome, sir. Welcome to our forum. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, we will begin shortly. Thanks, Thanks for your patience. Mr. Ansker, Dr. Ansker is with us. Uh, thanks for joining, sir. So uh, the forum is complete. Uh, I would like to commence the session. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. My name is Abbas Adik, and I will be the moderator of our today's session. Today's webinar is titled as Nuclear Deterrence in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, uh, Alarmist versus Complacence View. Uh, I'm a research associate at Center of Pakistan International Relations, and I'm leading the research on the implications of emerging technologies like cyberspace and artificial intelligence and its implications on the human, national, and international security and the role of these nascent technologies in sustainable development goals. Uh, Center of Pakistan and International Relations is a strategic think tank uh, working on building a positive narrative of Pakistan at national and international levels. Uh, COPER initiates and advocates uh, policies of national development in order to build a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient Pakistan. Uh, the Center of Pakistan International Relations, COPER, is dedicated to the study of defense and security, regional and global affairs, and it is a nonpartisan platform providing expert policy analysis. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to commence the session, but with the recitation of few verses of Holy Quran. Uh, thank you very much, Iftihar. So uh, moving onwards, uh, I would first like to set the baseline of the session. Uh, as you all know that we are here gathered here on uh, for discussing on a very important, very, crit very critical topic. Uh, we all know that artificial intelligence is the future, but uh, it poses serious concerns to the human national and international security. Uh, when uh, we uh, analyze the application of artificial intelligence in the domain of military affairs and especially in the domain of nuclear security. Uh, there we have uh, two uh, contradictory views. Uh, first, first is the alarmist view uh, which contend that uh, AI winter is unlikely and super intelligence of artificial intelligence have potential to disturb the prevalent nuclear deterrence. Uh, at the same time, we have the complacent view, uh, which says that uh, AI competition can lead to a strategic stability and uh, enhance the deterrence, especially the nuclear deterrence, because machines have no biases and they cannot make mistakes like human. Uh, thus, through the use of AI for the situational appearance, uh, awareness in defense, uh, there are uh, less chances of human errors and risks of miscalculation, which obviously, according to the complacent view, will foster the stability. So, uh, although we know that uh, the technology is in its embryonic and nascent phase of development, uh, and it also have its pros and cons, uh, at one end, uh, the application of AI for military modernization allows weaker nuclear armed states to overcome the imbalance of power while on the other side, it also exasperates the suspicion that dominant military powers may also employ it for further solidifying their uh, martial supremacy and engage in actions that are more uh, provocative. So uh, th this is why uh, COPER is organizing this webinar 
uh, we are having uh, a group of experts with us. Uh, we have Dr. Emmanuel Goffey and uh, Dr. Ansker. And we also have the president of Center of Pakistan International Relations, Ms. Anna Malik, with us. Uh, we expect the uh, panelists to uh, discuss about the implications of artificial intelligence, uh, its employment in military affairs, and especially in the decision making and the ethical concerns and regulations of artificial intelligence. So uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to move forward and introduce the first panelist of our today's session. Uh, we have Dr. Emmanuel Coffey with us. Uh, he's an expert in ethics of artificial intelligence. He's currently serving as the director of observatory on ethics and AI at Institute Sapiens. He is also an assistant professor and international academic relations director at Evian City School for Technology, Business and Society in Paris. Uh, along with this, he also serves as the director of ethics and senior advisor of the board at Mediterranean Council and Forum. Uh, today, he will be talking about the ethical normative framework of AI and his topic of speech is uh, learning from nuclear regulations toward a non-Western ethical perspective on the military use of AI. Uh, Dr. Goffey, thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, definitely. Uh, I will share my screen. Uh, I will just, if you could just activate the, uh, the sharing for the screen, I cannot share it so far. You just allow me to share my screen that would be great and first and foremost i would just thank you for having me today uh, with all those great panelists and on this really interesting uh, uh, subject uh, I'm, I'm really proud and really honored to be to be with you today i hope that my my perspective on the uh, ethical standpoint the ethical perspective on on the subject would be uh, of help or useful to you um okay still cannot share my screen if you can allow me to do so, that would be great. Thank you. I will just um, uh, start even without sharing my screen right now um, about, about this point. And we, we are talking about the, uh, um, the marriage between artificial intelligence and nuclear weapons and the risks that are associated to this, uh, to this kind of, of, uh, of mixture between those two uh, technologies that are really important right, uh, right now. And there is a big debate, a big discussion be between uh, among scholars and among observers as well uh, about the risks and the benefits that could be uh, withdrawn from the uh, uh, fr from this marriage between AI and nuclear weapons. So, we got a lot of people that would say that obviously uh, AI associated to uh, uh, nuclear weapons could pose a risk in terms of. At some point, if we are no longer in control of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence could make decisions that could have really heavy consequences for, for us in, in the use of those nuclear weapons. On the other hand, you get a lot of people that uh, would say, conversely, that uh, AI is much more something that would be beneficial to nuclear weapons in the sense that it would allow us to have much more information on uh, on, on the threat that we are uh, facing and how to use those nuclear weapons we, we should be, we would be a bit more precise on, on targeting uh, some, uh, uh, some, some goals specifically speaking, but also it would improve the, uh, the rapidity, the, the, the quickness of the, uh, of the decision making process. So you have different stances on that, two different stances on that. Some people would say that the risks that we are seeing with AI uh, fitted nuclear weapons is not something new. It's just enhanced by artificial intelligence, but it's new technology, but at the very end, uh, nuclear technology, nuclear weapons are, are still uh, risky. Uh, I will just see if I can share my screen. That would be great. No, I, I, I can share my screen, okay. Uh, so this must be put into a wider context that you certainly know about if you are international relations scholars, uh, which has been coined by Robert Jervis in 1976, which is called perceptions and misperceptions. Uh, everything when it comes, and especially when it comes to uh, defense and security is to some point related to the fact that we are perceiving our environment as threatening or not threatening or something in between, but it's all a matter of perception. When it comes to AI uh, applied to uh, nuclear weapons, obviously we have two things that are 
uh, that are under you know, the creation of this perception first, the risks associated with nuclear weapons, but also the perception that we have in terms of the advancements of our adversaries uh, in, in the domain of artificial intelligence. Uh, quite recently, uh, it was two years ago, three years ago, uh, there's been a, uh, a report by the, uh, by the RAND Corporation in, in which it was clearly stated, and I read it, uh, uh, the effect of artificial intelligence on nuclear strategy depends as much or more on adversaries' perceptions of, the cap of its capabilities as on what it can actually do. So what you can see is that added to this perception, this question of perception and misperception in international politics that has been developed by Robert Jervis, you also have this question of the perceptions that maybe your adversary is much more advanced than you uh, in terms of artificial intelligence. So depending on the perception you have, and also depending on the relation you have with, your, uh, with other actors, you can see that as threatening or on the contrary, as something that could definitely help you to collaborate. I will share my screen now. I mean, if it's possible. Great, fantastic. Okay. So this is this is the the, the wide context of international relations that uh, you certainly all know about. Um, all that obviously, all those perceptions are part of the way we are constructing the reality around us. And, and um, it's, it's obvious, for example, that a country like Pakistan must definitely feel threatened much more than we are here in France and, and, or, or in other places like Canada. So the perception that we have of our environment, the relation we have with our neighbors will definitely shape the perception that we have of the need for security. That's something that is really important. And that has been also developed by Alexander Wendt uh, in a seminal article uh, written in 1992, which is called uh, Anarchy is what uh, states make of it. So those perceptions are really in, important when it comes to dealing with uh, artificial intelligence and, and nuclear weaponries. Those perceptions, and this is something important that you have to know, this is why I'm calling for a non-Western perspective on, on the subject, are grounded in specific culture. Uh, and, and, and you definitely know that uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence specifically, <clears throat> the codes and norms that have been set so far have been set and, and, and created mainly by Western countries through a Western prism, through a Western perspective regarding what is acceptable and what is not, definitely on the terms, on the, on the ethical uh, standards. So those perceptions that we have about our environment, about the risks, that are associated with the uh, nuclear weapons that are held by this or that actor or by artificial intelligence must be related to our culture, to our history and to our geopolitical considerations. Uh, when you're surrounded by people that are threatening you, obviously you will have a different ethical perspective on what is acceptable and what is not than a country like France, which in Europe is pretty safe, right? So you will, definitely in a country that is surrounded by enemies uh, or people that are threatening, you would definitely accept things that would not be acceptable in other places. This is, uh, this is a very constructivist approach, if you are aware uh, and if you know about it. Uh, this is a, uh, it's not the theory of international relation at the very beginning, it's a social uh, process to understand uh, how uh, things are working in, in the society, and it has been applied also to the international relation beyond that book that has been written by uh, Peter Berger and Thomas Lukman in 1966. And actually all that, the culture, the perception that we have will lead us to create a social reality around us, right? And we will all understand, and the same community will understand the environment through the same perspective, through the same lens, you will see it, and we will understand it through the same eyes. So when you have to set norms or standards, you have to take that into account, right? You have to take those perceptions, those specific perceptions into account. You have to understand that the strategic needs of a specific country are really specific to its environment, to its culture, and to its, um, uh, to its history uh, as well. So obviously, when you have to think about the normative framework uh, for AI fitted weaponries, you will have to think about, for example, ethics. Uh, we are not yet at the point where we're talking about uh, uh, legal framework for, for AI for many reasons, I won't uh, dive into that. But uh, we all know that for the moment, we are mainly speaking about the uh, ethical uh, 
safeguards that we can set uh, for uh, for AI and then apply to, to weaponries. So when we go back to the ethical standards that we want to set at the international level, if, if possible, we'll see that later. We also have to think about the fact that those ethical standards are rooted in our culture, right? And we also have to keep in mind that's really important that in some places, some countries, for some people, ethical consideration are not even a question. Uh, a friend of mine that that is in the uh, in the middle that is living in the Middle East uh, was telling me that uh, you are lucky. It was telling me, okay, you you're lucky in the West because you have time to think about philosophy, right? We don't have that time because our philosophy is just to survive in a really hostile environment, right? So in some places, some countries, some people, they do not even question uh, ethically the um, the, uh, the legitimacy of artificial intelligence. Do not even question. Uh, uh, ethics per se. All this must be, um, and especially regarding artificial intelligence, put into a wider context when it comes to ethics also, which is the interests that are at stake. And you all know that uh, in the field of artificial intelligence, you have two big leaders, two giants that are uh, actually competing on the international scene, which are the United States, the United States of America uh, and, and China. Those two big actors, when they think about the ethical ins and outs of artificial intelligence, they are thinking about it in a framework which is the competition between them, but also with other actors that are entering this race. So their ethical perspective will be shaped, influenced by this competition and by this geopolitical uh, competition that they, 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 are, uh, they are actually involved in today. So it's all about the US, it's also about China, definitely. Uh, China, and you know that, uh, stated clearly that it wanted to be the, uh, the leader in artificial intelligence by 2030, uh, which is uh, nine years from now. Uh, the US in, in 2019 stated the fact that they wanted to remain the leader in the domain. But at the same time, you also had President Putin from Russia stating that who, uh, whoever would, be, uh, would lead the, uh, the, the AI domain, would, lead the world, would, would be the ruler of the world that was in 2017, showing that Russia was also in the race. And many other countries, Saudi Arabia has, has, has put a lot of money on that, is now ranked 50th, uh, country, 15th country sorry, in, the, um, uh, in, in, in the ranking of, of AI countries. And you have another actor that is really interesting, I think, uh, in, in that domain, uh, which is the European Union. And, and why do I mention the European Union? It's because the European Union has clearly, clearly seen that it is totally impossible to compete against the US and China. This is something that you can see in the statement uh, by the European Commission. Uh, the European Union is pretty, pretty aware that there is no way that we could, we could compete with China and, and, and uh, the US. So what the, uh, the European Union did actually, that it found a niche, a way to differentiate itself from the two big actors, right? And this niche is what we call the normative aspect of artificial intelligence. So now the European Union is trying to develop, to set standards and to impose them to the rest of the world, showing its willingness to really be a normative actor on, on, on the subject. But when you look at all the documents that have been issued by the European Union, all the reflections that are behind all those documents, what you will see is that the EU is pretty clear about the aims of all that. The question, as it is written on the on the slide here, uh, is not of winning or losing a race, but of finding a way of embracing the opportunities offered by AI, and then in a way that is human-centered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So the point when you look at the European Union, they want to be part of that. So they want to get the share of this big pie, definitely, and knowing that they cannot compete with the US and China, what they're doing is trying just to put their own perspective, which is a normative perspective. That's obviously uh, problematic because European Union is a really small country compared to big countries like China or India, right? Uh, and, and pretending that we can impose a set of rules or a specific perspective to the rest of the world, um, I think it's, it's pretty unethical to some point and uh, at least a bit disputable. But to understand this competition, you also have to look at those figures. I will not go deep into that, but uh, you, you can find this report by the PwC 
uh, that has been issued in, in 2017. And you will see that behind all that questions about uh, discussion of AI, there is a lot of money. There are lots of things that are at stake, not only money, but also diplomatic uh, power. It's also about uh, research and development, education, transportation, finance, lots of things that are impacted by artificial intelligence. So the interests are really, really strong, really, really high. Lots of money can be made out of this development of artificial intelligence in the civil sphere, but also in the military one. And that's why, and, and again, really interesting uh, document, even if it's a little bit dated now, by Tim Dutton uh, from Canada, uh, where he was mapping all the the, um, the AI strategy for, from different countries, uh, starting with Canada uh, to to the European Union, and what he actually saw and what he highlighted in this document is that if you look at those strategies, and that's obvious that that can be really obvious to to say that, but all those strategies are set on very specific interests. So as he is uh, writing it. All governments are taking very different approaches to promote the development of the same technology. So we are talking all about talking about uh, AI, but the strategies are really different because all the strategies are aiming at a specific goal uh, that has been uh, decided by the government. And in those strategies, something that is really interesting to you is that um, sometimes there is no even any kind of mention of of, uh, of ethical questioning, right? I get a lot of people that are that a lot of countries that are not even uh, questioning on the ethical side uh, the relevance of uh, artificial intelligence of its use or of its development. This is the big picture. Then, if you move to the uh, military side, uh, which is related to the nuclear weaponry that we're talking about, uh, obviously you also have to take into account this international context of uh, the increasing arms trade, and, and you all know that uh, arms is a uh, our arms market is, is really, uh, really dynamic. And we know that with some countries that are leading this market again, uh, the United States, Russia, France, Germany, China, top exporters in that. And now you can see uh, some figures here with lots of US and, and Chinese company that are in the 25 top companies, top ranked companies uh, in, in, uh, in arms, uh, arms market. Uh, and you can see also, if you only look at the artificial intelligent military market, uh, you can see that it would be worse 13 billion US dollar uh, in 2026, which is a huge amount. And just think about the United States, Russia, France, Germany, China, they want, they do want a share of that, definitely. If I only take the example of France, we are depending on the year's fourth or fifth exporters of arms. We cannot, we cannot, definitely, we cannot just get rid of this amount of money, this uh, uh, th this part of our uh, uh, domestic uh, product. So we need, we need to be sure that we will benefit from uh, all the advantages that, the, uh, that could bring uh, uh, AI. So the question then is, is what, uh, what is the role of ethics in all that, right? Lots of people would say that pursuing, you know, uh, uh, financial or economic of, uh, uh, of or diplomatic uh, interest is not ethic. I would say that, yes, it is ethic. Actually, it can be ethic, but it's not ethics in the sense that we don't see that as valuable for the uh, for the entire population for the for the whole world so i would say that ethics here is really contextual and we have to think about what i was saying at the very beginning that ethics is anchored in your culture uh, so what's something that could um, that could seem not ethical to me could think could, could seem ethical for other actors depending on the context they live in definitely so what can we learn from that? Um, first, we can learn that we have been so far unable to agree on uh, a shared values or even one shared value uh, on which we can just build uh, ethical standards. This is true for artificial intelligence. This is true for nuclear weaponries. I, I won't go into, because I'm sure you know about the uh, non-proliferation treaty uh, in 1968 um, and even the treaty uh, on the prohibition of nuclear weaponry that have been um, that have been uh, that are that actually entered in force uh, early this year in January, and and you know that all countries are not part of it. You know that it is quite discriminatory. You know that lots of people do not agree with the uh, with the standards that have been set, and you know that, for example, with the, the last treaty that has been uh, uh, that has been signed and ratified, the big countries 
the uh, the nuclear armed countries that are China, Russia, uh, France, the UK, and the USA did not sign it, did not participate in it, right? They, because they don't want to be constrained by that. So what we can see now is that whatever the normative uh, framework that we're trying to set, uh, we are not able to have a common perspective, which is normal because once again, back to what I was saying at the very beginning, what we think is acceptable depends on our environment, on our perceptions uh, of, the, of the risk of the threat around. Second thing that we uh, have to learn from that is that ethics is definitely not a top priority for all government all around the world. It is true for artificial intelligence, it's true for arms, it's true for nuclear weaponries, right? And I would even add that ethics is everywhere, but the perspective can be different. If I only take the continental philosophy, uh, I would say that, for example, the US is much more consequentialist in its uh, ethical perspective than the European Union, which is Kantian, the ontologist uh, in its perspective, right? So you can have different kind of ethics, and this is something that we have to accept. This is something that we have to embrace. Uh, there is not only one perspective on ethics, there are many, many uh, ethical perspectives. But these perspectives are not at the top of the priority list of uh, AI strategy and military strategies of, um, of governments all around the world. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, power is much more important than uh, even ethical considerations. Third, uh, which is also uh, uh, important to keep in mind, is that, and that's obvious in the international realm, is that each country is pursuing uh, specific interests. And then depending on those interests that have been set by the government, uh, they will try to set ethical, very, very specific ethical standards, right? So depending on, once again, the, the perception that you have on, on your environment, you will say if you are under the threat of your neighbors, you will definitely see uh, defense industry arms and the development of AI fitted weaponries as something really valuable, so something really acceptable. While in countries like Europe or Canada, where in a safe when we are in a safe environment, we will see that as something that would not be um, uh, that acceptable. So this is these are the three things that uh, uh, we really have to learn from all that. So the big question then is to say. Can we really reach the point where we'll find uh, an international uh, set of rules, international standards? And, and can, we, can we just believe that at some point national security or national defense could rely on international standards? If we look at the, um, the regulation on uh, nuclear weapons, I would say definitely not. That doesn't work, right? So you can obviously say that it's better than nothing to have the, uh, uh, the uh, non proliferation non-proliferation treaty, but uh, we see that it doesn't work, right? And there is a lot of loopholes in this in this treaty and in the, in the last one of January. Uh, so the risk that we have now is that if we are still running toward this, uh, this uh, international reglementation would be to, to reach a point where we have, sorry for that, where, where, where we have a kind of a, a set of rules that are cosmetics. And what I call cosmetics is the use of ethics to put a layer of makeup on things that are ugly, right? You don't want to show the ugliness of the world uh, and you don't want to show the ugliness of the system of the international relations system. Then you're just putting this kind of layer of makeup on that and you're not doing ethics, you're doing cosmetics. And this is mainly done through, uh, through language and through narratives. So we really have to avoid that. And we have, I think, to adopt a very consequentialist approach. Uh, we have, if we want to set norms regarding AI fitted weaponries in, in the, the field of nuclear weapons, we really have to be consequentialist and ask ourselves what, in which way can we reach the, um, the point where we'll maximize the satisfaction of the greatest number in our countries, right? Because this is the role of any uh, government to maximize the satisfaction of its own people. So this is the, the aim that we all have to uh, pursue uh, at the international uh, at the international level. So I will just conclude, say that the following is that I do believe that there is no way to think that there will be any kind of international efficient ethical regulations. And I do believe that ethical regulations should be local as long as they're related to security or defense issues, right? Which is really realist approach, uh, uh, going back to international relation theory, but at the, same, at the same time, that doesn't mean that we have only to be consequentialist. We can also be deontological, meaning that we can accept it, 
we can be you know constrained by rules so it's just a mix of both of those uh, theories which are called the ontological the ontological uh, consequentialist approach which is okay let's go toward a specific goal which is the defense and the security of our country and the maximization of the satisfaction of our people but at the same time we have to set uh, guardrails we really have to make sure that we will not move you know beyond some rules that we think are really important but those rules they must remain entrenched in specific culture so uh, last point is uh, i do think that in terms of artificial intelligence and, and uh, nuclear weapons we have to be both realist and idealist we have to see the world as it is and at the same time see the world as we want it to be but we not we must not be naive about uh, the fact that we will reach a point where all the countries, all the communities, all around the world, we agree on what is acceptable and what is not uh, in terms of uh, the use of artificial intelligence in uh, nuclear weaponry. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Goffey. So uh, very well taken uh, your stance on the considerations and especially the need of international regulations on the subject. Uh, what I observed uh, from your presentation that uh, your stance uh, falls in the alarmist category where they condemn that the inaptitude of the algorithms, uh, especially their uh, emo they do not consider the emotional, cultural and ethical, ethical things in uh, decision making or uh, especially when it is on the intersection of AI and nuclear issue or any sort of armament. Uh, my question here uh, to you is that, uh, what do you think that what should be the approach at the national level? Uh, like there are already several countries like Germany, UK, UAE, and several other countries which are work, which have an AI ethical committee or uh, a consortium or a forum like that, which is working on uh, ethics in the domain of AI. Uh, what do you think, what should be the strategy at national and international levels to regulate it in the domain of military affairs and then in the nuclear affairs? Yeah, I, I would say that, first of all, th there, there is no need, uh, from my opinion, to have uh, ethical reflection on that. In some places, uh, there is no ethical reflection. Once again, let's say that you are surrounded by countries that are threatening you. There is no ethical consideration. The only thing that you want is to survive, right? So you will do whatever it need, it's needed it needed to, uh, to, to survive in this environment. So it's not about ethics at all. It's just about survival. You can put that into an ethical context, right? But it's something that is really Western centered perspective. Uh, the, the question about ethics is really Western perspective. Uh, I don't find that, for example, in China, they don't have this kind of question. Definitely not, because the culture is really different. Confucianism is not about talking about or discussing ethics. Uh, so the, uh, the, the strategy would be for the government to say, what is important for my population? How can I, once again, maximize the satisfaction of my people? That's the point, right? And then you do whatever is needed for that. And then you can discuss with other actors all around you and just try to explain them what you're doing. Because you know that uh, in international relation, we often call, uh, talk about the what we call the security dilemma. If you improve your capacity, capabilities in terms of defense, other actors will see that as something that could be threatening to them, right? They don't know if it's only for defense or if, of, or if it's for offense. So you also have to have this discussion. You have to improve your capability. You have to make sure that you will maximize the satisfaction of your people. But at the same time, you have to communicate with others to tell them what you're doing exactly, right? But you also have to build a relation of trust because whatever you will say, if you're China and you're talking with the US, the US will never believe you. And China will never believe the US because there is a mistrust between those countries. So you have to develop your own national strategy depending on your own strategic interest. And then that would be really interesting to have kind of an international uh, regulatory body that would monitor all those you know, uh, initiatives that would be uh, taken in different countries and try to see if the, there is something that is common between all those uh, strategy and maybe build, if, if we can find something that is common, just built a new set of rules on this, uh, uh, this uh, common uh, perspective. 
thank you very much. Uh, if any of the participants uh, have any question, they can ask it directly or raise their hand. Uh, my one last question, I need a very brief answer about it. Uh, it's uh, uh, not related to the ethics or regulations of the AI. It's just, uh, I, I need your view, your personal opinion, uh, just maybe a one word that, what do you think? Uh, will AI, will, uh, will AI be able to lead us to, you know, to lower the threshold of war and leads to more stability and security in the future? I, I, I think that everything is open with artificial intelligence. It's just an, an answer of human behavior and human cognitive uh, abilities. So everything is open. And, and the thing that I would just say is that never, never just say that it's science fiction. Nothing is science fiction. Just think about the risks. Even if you find it really stupid, just think about the potential risks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manuel Goffey. Thanks for taking much during time for so much. Looking forward to collaborate with you in the future. Now, uh, I would like to move forward to our next speaker. We have uh, a very distinguished, a very well-known uh, global AI ethics and regulatory leader, Dr. Uh, Ansgar Kion. He is a PhD physics and computer behavior neurosciences from the Utrecht University. He also served as a research fellow at Horizon Digital Economy Research Institute in the UK and member of the AI ethics board at the Hayden AI. Uh, he is also associated with the IEEE, where he serves as the chair of IEEE Working Group on the Standard for Algorithm uh, Bias Consideration. Uh, so, Dr. Ansgar, uh, over to you, sir. Welcome on board. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak on this uh, important topic. Um, I will also uh, try to see if I can share my screen. It seems that I do have the access for this. Okay. So um, I wanted to really start off by um, connecting to one of the things uh, that Emmanuel was highlighting, the importance of perception. Uh, and if we are thinking, for instance, in a consequentialist uh, approach, our understanding of what the actual consequences of AI could be. So to begin with this, we really need to have a proper understanding of what is AI. And this is a rather complicated thing uh, because AI as a term is rather badly defined. Generally speaking, we find that uh, what is considered to be AI can range from very science fictional kinds of ideas of a super intelligence, for instance, down to what just a couple of years ago was just referred to as big data. Uh, or uh, any kind of a rule-based types of system. So what I'm showing here is the definition of AI that the OECD, for instance, uh, used in the OECD's AI principles that were published in uh, 2019 and highlighting some of the key aspects to this. First of all, um, machine-based systems, so taking a systems level approach to it, it's not just, if we are really thinking about the implications of AI, we need to think not just about the algorithm in its center, but also about the sensors, the data uh, ingestion, um, as well as the way in which the data is then going to be used after it has been uh, processed by the uh, algorithmic um, core part. Um, this machine-based system, uh, however, is still, even though it does autonomous learning potentially, if it is a machine learning one, for instance, the, um, the aims, the objectives that this machine-based system is working towards are human defined. The current state of AI development is such that we need to still tell the system what it is that it's supposed to be working towards. We need to define the loss function as it is called in, in technical terminology, um, the way in which uh, the machine learning will identify whether or not it's, it has achieved an objective. Is it getting better or worse? What is good is defined by humans. Um, the ways in which these systems are being used ranges from predictions, recommendations, and decision-making. Uh, often it is, more um, that it produces a recommendation, even if we're saying it's a decision-making system, the ultimate um, implication, the, the ultimate uh, turning that into an action 
still involves other factors, humans or other um, decision-making processes. And the AI systems uh, are designed to operate with varying levels of autonomy. So we have systems that are really just uh, a, a small cog in a larger um, process where uh, there are many steps of, uh, of human intervention. We have systems such as in drones that operate quite uh, autonomously within a, during a particular phase of operation, which is to say after we have told the drone where it is supposed to go, um, it will then follow that trajectory, but autonomously cope with wind changes or whatever uh, the environmental situations are. The, the little graphic here uh, highlights sort of what some of the key aspects specifically regarding machine learning that have caused some changes in the nature of this kind of an um, technological computation methodology that we're using. So traditionally, uh, we would start by defining the rules and the data sets that we're going to use, create a program, and that is then going to be used to generate answers. In the machine learning case, what we do is we actually define we define a um, success metric. We choose answers and data sets to train the system, and that and the system then generates the rules. An important aspect of this is the way that the system is generating the rules is fundamentally statistics. What the machine learning does is it looks for patterns within the pairs of input data and, and a predefined answer, or in an unsupervised system, it's just looking for patterns within the data that are extracted effectively on the basis of statistics. And the fact that these systems are effectively working statistically is an important element if we think about things such as the potential for generating bias, the potential for vulnerabilities regarding the quality of the data, uh, regarding also the quality of our definition of a success factor. And as such, um, the potential um, you know, level of reliability of the system if it is exposed to an environment that is slightly different from the original data set that we used for training. So if we think about AI in safety critical systems and uh, nuclear deterrence is obviously a highly safety critical uh, environment, uh, what we need to reflect on is the difficulty to provide formal proof for machine learning generated nonlinear statistical models. So the important part is machine learning, it is uh, the, the underlying rules in, in each of the nodes, uh, the, the processing stages is nonlinear. Um, and as I said, it is statistical. Um, and then in addition to that, it has a very high number of parameters. This makes it very difficult to generate a formal proof, a, an absolute guarantee around its performance. Uh, what you tend to do is you run it with uh, various training, uh, with various validation data sets in order to try to get a sense of its reliability and performance within the space. However, there is no absolute guarantee that given a particular type of input, the system cannot ge suddenly generate a completely um, unexpected type of behavior, a kind of model instability. What this means is generally speaking, we need to be thinking about embedding the AI system within a larger system that provides um, boundaries. Uh, safety rails uh, so that the system cannot go outside of those due to instabilities. The other part is the high parametric complexity, the fact that these systems tend to have a huge number of parameters. This is one of the strengths in a sense. It, it is where its ability to process big data sets that we haven't traditionally been able to deal with comes in, uh, but it also makes it very difficult for humans to interpret the system outputs correctly to interpret whether or not the system is actually doing what we thought it is doing or instead it is what's referred to as reward hacking it is achieving good performance on our metric of good performance within the test data set but in reality it isn't solving the task that we've put to it uh, the traditional example of this is from computer vision uh, where there have been various cases where 
the machine learning system seem to be performing very well against the test set. The, the most um, uh, frequently cited one being the test set of distinct distinguishing between dogs and wolves. Um, but further analysis has showed that the computers th that the decision actually wasn't based on anything within the image that related to the dogs or the wolves, but rather was based on background information, based on the fact that the wolves tended to have snow in the background. So this is a case of reward hacking. The AI is performing, seems to be performing very well on the task, but it's actually doing a completely different task than what we thought. Um, the other problem is just human interpretation of the output. Does the human uh, interpret the outputs of the system correctly? Because if we don't, then we that might lead to an error, not actually in the machine learning part, but in the human response to the outcomes. So this is, for instance, a big issue uh, when it comes to the fundamental understanding about that outcomes tend to actually indicate probabilities as opposed to absolutes, uh, but humans often interpret the outcome as an absolute. The next issue to think about regarding uh, safety critical systems is cyber attack vulnerabilities. The AI systems tend to be built and used from the point of view that it should automatically be ingesting large sets of data in order to be able to make uh, further um, interesting predictions. Um, however, this means it needs to be exposed to data streams. And as such, it is also automatically exposed to the potential for uh, the inserting false data. So if an adversary is aware of the kinds of data that your AI system uses in its decision-making process, they can start to uh, manipulate particular those kinds of data streams in order to try and push your AI to generate incorrect results. And this is potential, especially an issue if you link this to the uh, nonlinear instabilities that can be present in a machine learning system. So the adversary may explore variations of input data that could trigger a instability. In, in this. So uh, examples of this have been in the case of autonomous vehicles, for instance, where people have shown that if you put certain well-placed stickers on a traffic sign, that the autonomous vehicle will completely misidentify what this traffic sign is supposed to be. It will think that what is actually a stop sign, uh, that it is simply a speed uh, limit indication sign or something like that. Uh, and finally, an additional factor to consider is that due to the complexity of this technology, uh, many countries are placed in a position that they are dependent on foreign technology. So this is something that uh, Emmanuel also highlighted when he was talking about uh, that the US and China are very much the dominant powers when it comes to the development of AI. Uh, and the EU, for instance, has also identified this foreign technology dependence as a strategic vulnerability. Uh, and one of the things that new funding is aimed to, uh, to address. So think, for instance, regarding the dependence on um, chips, uh, uh, highly specialized computer chips coming from certain um, uh, places or uh, sensor technology or other. A false response. So surveillance is very important and computer vision is a great enhancer to the ability to understand uh, satellite or drone imagery. A similar thing uh, is true for text-based information which may come through things like media feeds or even social media feeds and this is where natural language processing can play an important role. 
uh, with the caveat that uh, natural language processing also is statistics uh, and it doesn't actually understand anything in the language. What it does is it, it picks up certain patterns of words. Um, however, this can still be a very important uh, enabler that allows uh, humans to subsequently be able to understand the general tone of um, conversation, the general uh, level of uh, potential threat that is living in the, in the adversary. Threat assessment within the command and control um, operations uh, at the military level. Uh, AI can play an important role in helping to basically process high dimensions of information rapidly in order to be able to combine, for instance, the information from textual data feeds and computer vision data feeds into a better understanding about the current threat level. Um, again, there is the need to, under to evaluate the uh, outcomes from the machine learning system, um, basically do a baseline check. Uh, does it make sense if the AI system has suddenly switched from a low threat to a very high threat uh, without other signals that might indicate this is the correct kind of response, then that might actually indicate that we are have that we're dealing with an instability in the system. So again, the general safety critical aspects need to be taken into consideration. However, as a general rule, um, just the ability to process the high levels of data is, is an important contrib contributor. Information gathering counterintelligence through cyber operations, again, uh, continuing along with this understanding what your uh, adversary is doing. Finally, and this is where potentially a completely new space opens up, is the autonomous weapon systems, or which basically variations of robotics. And within this, I would say there are basically two kinds of dimensions related to, to the nuclear space. One is anti-ballistic missile systems. And we've seen in recent years uh, that this raises a, 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 um, a threat to the established um, uh, deterrence uh, buildup. The, the, if one party has a strong anti-ballistic missile system, then that has the potential of negating the, the power balance. Um, and AI can play a role in this in improving the control systems of anti-ballistic missile weapons. Uh, on the other hand, uh, autonomous weapons could potentially lead to a new method of payload delivery. So moving away from the conventional missile-based methodology to something else. We see this, for instance, in some of the stuff that's come, that's come out from uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, when they are talking about uh, autonomous submarines that uh, they intend to uh, create that would be able to um, cross the, the ocean uh, and potentially loiter anywhere with uh, a nuclear payload on board. So these are potentially destabilizing factors that may come in. As far as international AI regulation is uh, concerned, uh, I think uh, Emmanuel also covered this uh, quite well already, there isn't really anything strong at this moment. Uh, we've seen discussions, particularly regarding lethal autonomous weapons um, at the UN's Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. Uh, however, this hasn't really gone anywhere because key countries, especially the US and Russia, um, are opposed to signing this, um, as well as some other countries. Uh, and really you know, what is the value of a, this kind of a convention if the dominant players in developing this kind of technology are not party to it. And actually we've seen in recent months uh, or last month, um, the uh, US uh, uh, publishing new work regarding uh, ethics principles for the use of AI in the military space. Um, and so there is a clear intention to continue exploring this um, while discussing potential sort of uh, ethical boundaries 
uh, to the way that they would use it. A lot of the other uh, international discussions uh, at the OECD, G20, um, UNESCO, etc., has currently focused more on civilian uses of AI um, and has tended to follow the pattern of starting with thinking about AI principles, high level principles that are in the ethical space. Um, with, uh, as Emmanuel highlighted, a lot of the work being led by the Western or, or Global North kind of countries, obviously OECD is, is, is that. Um, UNESCO uh, and the AI in Rome principles is one of the few um, global players here that is really trying to make sure that we get the Global South, the voice of the Global South into this conversation. Uh, however, the international attention is focused more on things that such as what's coming out of the OECD than it is on UNESCO. What UNESCO is doing is not really gathering a lot of attention. Finally, I wanted to point out uh, that the technical community is working on developing technical standards. So this is IEEE, ISO, IEC, to lesser extent uh, ITU as well, um, are working on developing technical standards to help define what is best practice in the space of AI, including uh, issues such as AI risk management. Um, much of that work started in 2017, 2018, and these standards typically take three to five years to develop. So uh, this year we are expecting to see some of the results of the standardization work to come out. Um, and uh, that more or less covers my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ansgar, for this wonderful and comprehensive presentation. Uh, there's one question I would like to you to answer. Uh, it is uh, more related to uh, uh, the technical aspect aspects of AI incorporation in military affairs. Uh, as you've already mentioned that there are prospects of, uh, you know, incorporation of AI uh, in the threat assessment, in the situational awareness, in the counterintelligence. And uh, we are, uh, as Pakistan is located in, uh, in South Asia, uh, we are bordering uh, with uh, a nuclear uh, deterrent nation, India. Uh, both nations are in sort of a security dilemma, um, which is why uh, both are not disarming their nuclear weapons. Uh, there are skirmishes at our border. Uh, we often have uh, armed conflict and uh, which uh, often the analysts argue that could lead to a nuclear escalation. Uh, here, um, the purpose of mentioning this context is to ask that uh, if AI is uh, you know, embedded or incorporated in the military affairs. Uh, what do you think? How these nations will uh, respond to each other? Whether there will be the situation will exasperate, or uh, will it pacify with the passage of time? So the the current state of AI, and I would say for the foreseeable future as well, is such that. Um, I do not believe that any sensible nation will be trying to make a fully autonomous um, decision loop where an AI would be triggering a response purely based on the sensory inputs that the AI is receiving without uh, a human intervention within this, uh, simply because of the various um, uh, factors regarding uh, guarantees on its behavior um, that I've mentioned before, uh, but also I believe simply because of the ultimate responsibility that needs to lie with uh, human decision makers as um, the only ones who can hold accountability. A machine cannot be hold, hold accountability for its actions. Uh, as such, I think that um, AI will probably be mostly beneficial in the sense of helping to gather more information and integrate this information, have a better understanding regarding the actual threat level. Um, to my understanding, um, is unlikely to be um, intentionally driven to a point of wanting to, to trigger a nuclear attack. 
um, unless matters change dramatically. Uh, for now, the kinds of skirmishes that we see are obviously meant to be kept at a um, contained level, and as such, uh, nuclear would not be included in this. So AI, through its uh, improvement in threat assessment, should be beneficial in that sense. Very much, Dr. Ansker. Uh, now uh, I would like to move forward before going onwards. Uh, if Dr. I would like to see if Dr. Goffey is with us. We have a question for him. I'm here. Yep. Yeah. So just a second. Yeah. We uh, there's a pan there there's a participant. Uh, he's also our advisor on. Uh, International Affairs, uh, Dr. Khalid Latif, uh, Mr. Khalid Latif. He just wants to ask a question. Uh, Mr. Khalid, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Are you with us? So uh, never mind. Uh, I will share the question with you in the email. Uh, I think uh, he's just dropped, uh, and you can answer that onwards. Uh, before moving onward, I would like to see that uh, we will have a series of webinars on this subject, uh, on the implications of emerging technologies, on the human, national, and international security, and we will be formulating. Uh, a comprehensive report which will be shared uh, with the policymakers, with the governmental and non-governmental institutions. Uh, this is just an introductory session. We will have more panelists. We already have a few very known persons, uh, very known uh, experts and practitioners of AI uh, on the panel, and uh, they will soon be joining us. I would also like to request Dr. Goffey and Dr. Ansker to be with us in the, our upcoming sessions. Now, uh, I would like to... Uh, uh, ask Ms. Amna Malik. She is the president of Center of Pakistan and International Relations, uh, a very well-known well human activist. Uh, she is leading our think tank, uh, especially uh, she, it's pertinent to mention here that she has uh, established the Center of uh, Cybersecurity and Center of Artificial Intelligence in the Pakistan. And uh, she has been awarded by the President of Pakistan, Dr. Arif Alvi, and former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Mr. Mahathir Mohammed, for her extraordinary contributions to the country. Uh, Ms. Amna Malik, are you with us? No, thank you. Thank you very much, Wes. And thank you very much. I listened carefully to Dr. Manil and Dr. Ansker. Uh, very informative discussion. And today for our final recommendation, which we are going to present in the form of a proper document. So as uh, I start with Dr. Manuel Gufi, you mentioned about the data science, deep learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning, which actually change the military application. And it is on the other hand, also a threat to nuclear deterrence doctrine on one hand. But on the other hand, what we also think and we are looking for, uh, and which I just want to add on, is that the, it has also revolutionized uh, the health industry, the energy sector. And there we can use this data science in the positive manner as well for our science diplomacy. And there we can have some collective, uh, you know, uh, informative sessions with the experts of different countries and we can utilize this uh, uh, energy in the positive aspects. Then we also discussed about the autonomous nuclear weapons, which can threaten the stability of peace. You mentioned about the case study of China, also US and other countries that how they are uh, working on the AI implications. Uh, we are also concerned that in South Asia, as India and Pakistan are uh, nuclear powers and they are, so in South Asia, there is a threat to nuclearization. So we are really concerned about it, that this uh, autonomous weapon can be used uh, uh, by, uh, by any hostile neighbor, or this can also happen in other parts of the world as well. So it is no doubt a game-changing technology with potential risk as well. And we need to see that, that how we can discuss. I, I'm thankful for your recommendation uh, that you mentioned that the 
we should have a comprehensive national strategy at the country level and at the global level a global strategy how to restrain it and how to uh, cater those potential risks you also also mentioned and highlighted that there should be a national comprehensive national security policy with the implication of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies and how the governments will act upon uh i also uh, believe that you also mentioned like uh, dr uh, ansker that uh, there should be some ethical regula regulation so that is uh, something which is very very important that uh, we need to work on international regulations and this is should be a global step by all the countries maybe through uh, some new organization or maybe uh, using using the existing international organizations well uh, now i move to dr ansker kon uh, we also listened to you quite carefully you mentioned about the ai principles and also you also highlighted the, the importance of human intelligence versus artificial intelligence system that still uh, the algorithms the data needs some kind of feedback so uh, you discuss well, well about it and also there should be a varying level of autonomy uh, of uh, artificial intelligence on implication of nuclear weapons so no doubt there is a technological competition and we need to work on potential reliability of the systems uh, there is one important uh, threat which you highlighted we have we have already done a discussion on that that is cyber attack vulnerability uh, we mentioned it also in our previous webinars and in our research paper and we recommended to our government and policy advocates as well that there should be a uh, some command and control system some centralized command and control system to manage these cyber threats because no doubt uh, on one hand this artificial intelligence help in the threat assessment and uh, you mentioned about the surveillance and controlling of the deep fake news you mentioned about it but on the other hand if there is no control so the government sovereignty uh, uh, is at threat uh due to this uh, uh deep learning cyber attacks and other things so we pick two of your important points which uh, at the end of the my session i request both of you if you want to add any other recommendation uh, first of all you mentioned uh, that you know uh, we are dependent on the foreign technology so you highlighted that it's very important that the indigenous technology and the government should work on their indigenous data because uh, for artificial intelligence data is like its food and uh, artificial intel intelligence is also utilized by the weaker nation because this can help them that if they don't have the military might or the economic might but they can use it for the negative purposes as well uh, as well as for the pos positive purposes so this is something that we need to further discuss and work on it and finally uh, which uh, both of you mentioned that cyber safety is something which is a global challenge and we need to work on cyber ethics cyber security cyber safety uh, there should be some controlling mechanism and regulation of artificial intelligence and algorithms so i believe that this is the first step we discussed about artificial intelligence and nuclearization but inshallah we are going to move ahead uh we we are having uh, uh two advisors uh, on this subject one is dr zafar jaspal we, we who is a phd in nuclearization and the other is dr sajid baloch who is an expert in artificial intelligence and in autonomous weapons implications uh, uh, in uh, uh, in pakistan so looking forward to work with you in future and uh, lastly i request you that would you like to add some other points in the recommendations so that we can finalize our two day session so first i request dr emmanuel and then i request dr ansker thank thank you for for all that and uh, yeah i i would not definitely had um, any other recommendation i just want to once again insist on the fact that as you were saying regarding ai there is a strong need for a really specific uh, country focused reflection on that right 
because if there is, let, let's say I, I was discussing with India and, and, and as it was uh, mentioned earlier also, obviously Pakistan is in a situation where you have neighbors that can be threatening differently, right? So it makes the situation very difficult for you guys. But the point is that I've, dis I've been discussing with India and what strikes me, and that's the same for China, is that there is no reflection on AI ethics from an Hinduist perspective. Mm -hmm. And if you go to China, there is no ethical reflection from a Confucian perspective. And I do think that for countries like Pakistan, there is a need for a Muslim perspective on what is ethical, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. So there is this need once again to think about AI ethics through the prism of your own culture. And then once you've done that with our country, you can see if there are things that are matching with each other and things on which you can build and we can build together, right? But please, uh, that, that's really what I'm, I'm calling for because China is doing something that is opposite, but China is in a different situation, obviously, is that China is developing its own reflection based on the expectation of the West. So if you look at all the code of ethics, all the reflection on the ethics that are being conducted in China so far, it's not about the Chinese thinking about that. It's just about how China can, you know, open new markets in the West and how China can, you know, uh, uh, suit the expectation of the West. Uh, so at the very end, what ha what's happening is China is developing codes that are looking like Western codes, but they don't believe in it, right? So they will not apply it fully. Right? So develop your own reflection based on your own culture and your own interest, and then see with the international community, and I do agree on the fact that there is a need for a new neutral international body that would not regulate, but that would monitor the regulation all around the world and see what is feasible from those regulations and see if there are things that are matching together and see if we can build from that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I request Dr. Ansker, uh, is, is it a new kind of devil's theory? Because on one hand, you know, there are some uh, private organizations which are gaining uh, uh, good, good profits out of it. On, on the other hand, you know, uh, the world is at threat. So please. Thank you. Yes. So um, definitely one of the elements that I would highlight is the need to operate from a point of in informed decision making, informed policy making. So really making sure that you understand the technology that you're actually talking about. Uh, so diff because AI, due to the language that tends to be used, I mean, we're talking about intelligence, we're talking about learning, we're talking about decision making, all of these are very human terms that we are using that tends to blur the reality of what the system is actually doing from what we think it is doing because we immediately use this human language to think from our own perspective as if it was understanding the world that, the way that we do. Uh, but in reality, it has a completely different um, mode of seeing the world, so to speak, again, using human language. Um, which can lead to misconceptions about what it is. So I would definitely um, emphasize the need for informed decision-making here. And what that implies also is that, yes, at a high level, we can talk about AI principles, but when we get down to regulation, when we get down to the specifics about what is okay and what is not okay for the use of AI, we need to actually be talking about the specifics of what is okay for computer vision? What is okay for natural language processing? What is okay for supervised machine, machine learning versus unsupervised machine learning? Because these have different properties. We need to become more specific. And this is actually something that I believe we will also be seeing in all countries as they move from the high level discussions to the specifics as to how we're we actually going to regulate this, that they have to move away from the one piece of legislation for all of AI to saying, actually, this type of AI used in this context has certain kinds of requirements. Um, so I would very much um, recommend uh, an approach that goes into the more specific thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for your comprehensive recommendations. The key takeaway, uh, I must say that uh, Dr. Emmanuel Goffi said that uh, we need to uh, think locally in terms of ethical regulations as far as it is pertinent to uh, national security. And as Dr. Ansker said, the key takeaway is we need to become more specific uh, when uh, we talk about the AI regulation or legislation. Uh, with this, we come to an end of our today's webinar. Uh, we will have uh, more such webinars on the same subject. Uh, and we would like to have Dr. Emmanuel and Dr. Ansker with us. Uh, this webinar highlighted the ethical and normative aspects of the artificial intelligence with respect to uh, the, utility, the utility of the technology in national security, in nuclear deterrence, or in the applica its application in the decision making or threat awareness. So uh, we will compile a report of this webinar, uh, a post-event report and a report of the recommendations. Uh, we will be sharing it with our audience, uh, our participants. They can visit our website and they can find it there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, with that, uh, I must say goodbye to all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Definitely enjoyed it. Take care. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Doctor.